In Ecuador, two men have been arrested in connection with the murder of a prosecutor whose work included tracking down illegal drug cartels. The prosecutor was investigating the storming of a TV station by narcotics traffickers last week. Drug cartels have been waging a bloody campaign of kidnappings and killings. The violence began when a notorious gang leader escaped from prison. Armed police enter a major Ecuadorian prison near the city of Guayaquil, rounding up inmates as government forces try to crack down on rapidly escalating gang violence. It was from this prison that gang boss Adolfo Macias, also known as Fito, escaped, sparking major violence across Ecuador. A government prosecutor is the latest casualty. Cesar Suarez was investigating the recent storming of a TV studio by armed gang members. He was shot dead on Wednesday. Two men have been arrested over the killing and his colleagues are appealing for more protection. Organized crime groups, criminals, terrorists will not stop our commitment to Ecuadorian society. We will continue doing our work with more strength and more compromises. It must be clear to all that this atrocious act is a message to those who are working for justice in Ecuador. We call on law enforcement to guarantee the security of those of us who are fulfilling this mission. The government blames the situation on the growing reach of cocaine trafficking gangs, which have destabilised swathes of South America. President Daniel Noboa has declared a 60-day state of emergency. But gangs have hit back hard with kidnappings and killings, leaving many Ecuadorians in fear that the situation could spiral out of control. Well, I'm joined now by Van de Felbaum Brown. She's the director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors at the Brookings Institute. It's good to have you with us. You know, we just saw in that report how the Army, the police in Ecuador have launched this huge operation inside this prison complex in the city of Guayaquil. Can you explain to our viewers how this prison, how it could become the center of what has become a drug war in the country? Well, uh, just like in many other parts of Latin America, uh, prisons um, have been both stuffed with inmates or those arrested on suspicions of having uh, committed crimes, often without being convicted. And yet at the same time, they are breeding grounds of organized crime. They are often very powerfully connected to violence on the street. And of course, what's happening in Guayaquil, what's happening in the prison, it's one important element of the violence in Ecuador. Uh, but it is just one element. There are mm -hmm. very many other sources that go way beyond the prison and beyond um, FITO. L L yeah, I want to st stick with FITO for a moment. This gang leader, also known as Adolfo Macias, I mean, he was imprisoned in this prison until he escaped last week. How big of a role does he play here? Well, uh, Fito um, has been the leader of uh, Los Chonerones, the very important uh, criminal group in Ecuador that is connected to the Sinaloa cartel. And it's really the linkages to the Sinaloa cartel and cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion, the two Mexican uh, criminal groups at war with each other that has um, set a violence really across the southern cone, amplifying local dynamics. Um, however, as important as Fito is as the leader of the Chonerones, he is just one man. Um, mm -hmm. He became leader four years ago. If he uh, is arrested or killed, uh, the violence and the gangs will go on. You know, up until a few years ago, Ecuador was considered a bastion of peace in Latin America. It was a top destination for U.S. retirees looking to spend, you know, the, the, the best parts of their life. That's all changed now. Why has this big change happened in such a short space of time in Ecuador? Well, again, I think that we have to a little bit analyze the short space of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we have been witnessing dramatic uh, events, high violence over the past uh, year. 
Uh, but violence has been building up since COVID-19, and violence has had its uh, roots really going on for over a decade. But we have a set of policies across um, various administrations in Ecuador, uh, weakening on purpose or accidentally judicial institutions, prison institutions, and law enforcement capacities. And at the same time, we have the movement of the two cartels, at first Sinaloa, into a place like Ecuador, sandwiched between um, Colombia and um, uh, Peru, two important sources of cocaine. Ecuador mm -hmm. itself became a hub of transportation of cocaine to Europe. So there has been a long buildup of uh, institutional weakening, coinciding uh, most lately in, with this bipolar war between Sinaloa cartel and cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion yeah. and intersecting with local crime dynamics. So let's talk then for a moment about solutions here. Is the Ecuadorian government's crackdown, the, the military operations, the raids that we're seeing, is this the right way to go at this moment? Ms. Felbaugh Brown, can you hear me? Oops, it looks like we, unfortunately, we lost her. Uh, I, yeah. Can Can you hear me, Miss? I, I can hear you now. Um, okay, let me just. Yes, let me just I do. Okay, let me just ask you um, quickly before we run out of time. What's the best? What's the answer here to this? The, the The government's crackdown is that the correct way to solve this problem? Well, it's almost inevitably uh, an, an element of the answer, but it's certainly not sufficient. What really needs to happen is profound institutional strengthening that will take a long time, a lot of resources and commitments across several generations. In the meantime, the government does need to improve security on the ground. I am not persuaded that it will follow from the crackdown, uh, but I do understand how the government does need to take meaningful law enforcement situation to calm the streets and avoid egregious violence that we have been seeing. And, and where does all of this leave the Ecuadorian public? I mean, people must be, I assume, suffering from this ever-increasing amount of, of violence in the country. Well, absolutely. Uh, people in Ecuador have been suffering from many challenges, and we have seen great spikes of crime since the onset of COVID uh, in uh, 2020, uh, with its many repercussions. And the violence over the past year has really been horrendous. And we are currently in a major attack by the criminal groups on state institutions. The killing of the prosecutor, the killing of the political candidates, the riots in prison are all part of a systematic campaign to completely intimidate the state. And the state cannot be intimidated, including because it needs to protect as its primary responsibility, the Ecuadorian and, people. And, and what do you hear I inside Ecuador? Do you ever hear the argument that we wouldn't have this problem if we did not have the demand for cocaine in the U.S. and Europe? I mean, if there's no demand, then there are no drug cartels. Well, absolutely. You know, that is certainly a line that is heard across um, Latin America and in various other parts of the world that are dealing with drug trafficking. Of course, demand has become very complex. There is probably as much demand in Brazil and Argentina uh, per capita as there is in the United States. In the U.S., cocaine has declined as a drug of choice. Fentanyl and methamphetamine are really by far the dominant drugs. And it's the growth of cocaine in Europe that has been driving a lot of the shifts, including the trafficking into Ecuador. Uh, so, yes, addressing demand is very important. It's elusive. It hasn't worked well in any country. Uh, but it cannot be an excuse for poor law enforcement policies. Mm. Vanda Felbaugh Brown with the Brookings Institute in Washington. We appreciate your time and your analysis tonight. Thank you.